So uh, next 15 minutes or so, I am going to uh, do the editorial commentary, I think, on uh, maintenance. We have a ton of data that's appeared over the, first, uh, the last four years or so. And uh, I've entitled this State of the Art or State of Confusion. So we'll go from there, if we can go forward. My disclosures, I've been accused of pharmaceutical promiscuity, and this is proof. So um, Dr. Sao has already gone over this. Is it maintenance? Is it consolidation? Or is it, in fact, early savage, salvage as opposed to savage? And again, I think we have to um, define our terms. So prolonged therapy is really taking the original regimen and continuing it, perhaps in an attenuated dose or full dose. Um, usually, if we attenuate it, it's to mitigate the cumulative toxicity of uh, treatment. Continuation, as Dr. Sauce pointed out, is continue at least one component of the original regimen. We usually ditch the platinum and continue the non-platinum partner. And switch maintenance is an alternative cytotoxic in the case of the uh, JMEN trial, or an alternative targeted agent in the case of the Saturn uh, uh, trial. So um, others uh, will call this early second line, but I think that's a misnomer. Unless a patient has truly had progressive disease, the term second line uh, probably should not be applied. So if we really go back, and this is sort of a historic perspective, uh, this is the, one of the first trials that really looked at continued treatment. Uh, I wouldn't call it maintenance so much as prolonged therapy. Uh, Mark Szynski compared a truncated course of packed carbo four cycles versus uh, continuing that regimen until disease progression with endpoints of survival and quality of life. And again, I apologize for the degradation in this uh, slide, but it is in your book. It's on uh, page nine at the bottom. And what you can't see is that these curves are virtually superimposable. Uh, if you look at the raw numbers, about a two-month difference in median survival. But quickly after the median, the curves join together. So the p-value is not significant. Certainly no major differences in one- and two-year survival. And you see a doubling in neurotoxicity. And we tend to concentrate on grade three toxicities. Well, patients complain about grade one and two neurotoxicity. And if we just look at grade two, you uh, go up from 14% to uh, 27 percent. Um, this is a, another trial from uh, the same, uh, actually preceded that era, uh, comparing a abbreviated course of MVP, a regimen we uh, really have historic uh, uh, interest versus a longer course of six cycles. So not prolonged till disease progression, but short versus long. Same basic outcome. This one month difference is not significant. Response rate a little bit higher, as you can imagine, more toxicity for the six cycles, and this is on the uh, middle of page 11 in your book. But the bottom line, no significant difference in survival for the entire group. And if you look at a landmark analysis of those who managed to get all three, at least three cycles, and again, no significant difference in that group or the good performance status group. Um, the first trial that really put this whole uh, subject on the map, as far as I'm concerned, was the Phidias trial. Uh, and this, uh, to, to date, this is probably the best design trial. So it took folks who had been on gem carbo for four cycles, and in the absence of disease progression, they went on to an immediate switch maintenance with docetaxel for six cycles versus delayed docetaxel. And that was actually built into the st uh, study, uh, again, for six cycles. So these folks were observed, and then once they had disease progression, they went on to uh, uh, standard second-line docetaxel. So you can see about... 56% of those who were originally treated with gem carbo were randomized. Uh, intriguingly, of the 154 that went on to delayed docetaxel, or at least randomized that, only 91 truly received it. Uh, presumably, uh, they dropped out for other reasons because of uh, declining performance status or other comorbidities. Again, slightly degraded, but you see a significant improvement in PFS. 20% on the immediate arm are free of progression at a year. You go back 20 years, uh, you were lucky to see 20% one-year survival, let alone PFS. And you see a telling trend here for overall survival, about a two and a half, uh, nearly three-month difference. Uh, the p-value here is 0.085. Uh, is this negative for survival, or is it truly underpowered? And uh, Many have argued that 300 patients was insufficient to really detect a significant difference. And if it had been a larger trial, 500 to 600 patients, we might have seen a difference. And um, Dr. Sao has already pointed out this trial. This uh, is really what changed the therapeutic landscape. And this was a switch maintenance trial, the JMEN effort, two to one randomization of PEM versus IV placebo. Try to get that through your IRB. Uh, and patients who had stabilized or responded to four cycles of uh, 
either gem or taxane combined with uh, platinum. You could take your pick which platinum. Uh, uh, a global trial with PFS as the primary endpoint. Uh, and this was before the histologic distinction, so about a quarter of the patients had squamous histology. Uh, you can see that about a quarter were never smokers. About a third of the patients enrolled in this effort were uh, from Asia. Uh, and there's an equal distribution of PAC carbo and either gem carbo or gem cis in terms of the prior regimens. About half, the, this is a good group of patients, about half have actually responded to treatment. You see a major PFS improvement, a doubling overall, a hazard ratio of 0.6, uh, with lots of zeros in that p-value, and that is entirely driven by the non-squamous cohort. The HR drops here to 0.47. Squames, uh, IV uh, uh, sugar water does as well as uh, pemetrexid in that setting. And that, in turn, drives the survival advantage, uh, nearly three-month improvement. Again, hazard ratio under that magic 0.8 number, the p-value of 0.012 again, confined strictly to the non-squamous cohort. Five-month difference in median survival. We don't see that sort of difference typically in advanced disease, uh, certainly in advanced uh, lung cancer. Absolutely no difference in the uh, squamous cohort. And if you look specifically at the non-squamous group, the uh, uh, histology deriving the greatest benefit are adenocarcinoma patients, so 16.8 versus 11.5 months. Uh, and here's the uh, forest plots, and uh, with the exception of squamous and large cell and East Asians, just about every other group having some uh, survival advantage. So the first randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial to demonstrate a significant survival benefit for switch maintenance, uh, non-squamous histology was predictive of improved efficacy, in this case with pemetrexid. And overall, it was fairly well tolerated and really devoid of cumulative toxicity. So as D Dr. Salas pointed out, this joins a whole panoply of trials that have looked at switch maintenance. Every single one of these has shown an advantage for PFS. And both the JMEN trial, Celianu, and the Capuzzo or Saturn trial have also shown survival advantages. And we now have at least four and counting continuation maintenance trials, three of the four have shown an improvement in PFS. The one that did not included PS2 and PS3 patients. So again, this only applies to good performance status patients. And now we have the um, Paramount trial from Pazaras showing that continuation Pemetrex in the same setting, two to one randomization, also results in a survival advantage. But there are a number of potential criticisms, and I'll go through each of these in uh, 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 some detail. A significant percentage of our patients will not get to enjoy the fruits of maintenance pemetrexid. So you go back to the Phidias trial, note here only 56% were actually randomized. Uh, uh, presumably these patients either had toxicity or uh, their disease progressed. So, uh, and this is nothing more than therapeutic reality. Uh, intercurrent comorbidities, a lot of our patients don't want to go beyond four to six cycles. They want a break. They'd rather vacation in Florida or Tahiti or some other warm, sunny place. Um, the benefits of PEM, remember, are confined to the non-squamous population, which is about two-thirds of the remainder. So if you do the math, it's probably only 44% of the entire advanced stage, good performance status, non-small cell population. And if you use Phidias as our reference point, it's less than 40%. So again, benefits are confined to less than half of those who actually start first-line treatment, maybe less than 40%. Probably the biggest criticism is, uh, is this early second-line versus second-line uh, progression. And mandatory crossover at the time of progression was not instituted in the JMEN trial. So if you look at the placebo group, about 80% uh, of those who went on to post-study therapy, which is only two-thirds, received a validated second-line treatment, but only 19% actually got pemetrexid. So again, it was not, unlike the Phidias trial where they had a, an assignment to second-line docetaxel at the time of progression, that did not occur in this uh, effort. And what's interesting, if you go back to the Phidias trial and the, look at those who actually received docetaxel in the um, delayed arm, and again, this is uh, um, washed out here, but it's in your book, I think it's, uh, page 20 at the very bottom. So this is the, the late arm here. If you manage to get um, second line dose of taxol, your survival is really no different from those who got immediate uh, dose of taxol. So at least uh, salvage in that setting uh, poses no compromise to long-term survival. So I think um, an institution of mandatory crossover at the time of progression would have inoculated this study from probably the most important criticism 
uh, that the uh, survival advantage uh, um, was not obtained in that setting uh, for J-men and for, frankly, for Saturn. Toxicity of pemetrexid, though mild, is not entirely trivial. So by and large, the grade three and four toxicities are 5% uh, or less. This is phenomenal. We're used to uh, drugs that are far more toxic. Only 5% of patients uh, discontinue treatment early. But if you look at all grades, there's still a fair amount of grade one and two. Uh, grade one and two fatigue is not fun. There's some anorexia, nausea, and we do have patients eventually dropping out. I have seen people with uh, epiphora and other weird uh, toxicities, some fluid retention. So uh, although it's low and only 5% drop out for side effects, the cumulative effects of grade one and two, particularly if fatigue and asthenia cannot be discounted. And remember, this is the palliative care setting. We are not curing these patients. And many of these folks will stay on maintenance treatment far longer than their original induction regimen. So again, um, toxicity, not a major issue, but still some issue. Uh, early institution of second line treatment is not necessary in a sizable proportion of patients. So if we go back to J-men, you look at the curves here, about 50% in the placebo group are still free of progression at two months. And in fact, at uh, about six months, it's 10 to 15%. So if their disease is relatively indolent, um, it would not be unreasonable for these folks to have a therapeutic holiday, give them time to recover from platinum-based toxicity. 50% uh, or more can have a two-month window. Again, time to travel, participate in family events. We are treating metastatic end-stage disease, reconstitute the immune system. Um, many are asymptomatic at the time of progression, and that certainly gives us time to uh, implement second-line treatment, uh, particularly if the disease is relatively indolent. But in many of the countries where this study was performed, second-line treatment was not available. And I think in that regard, not being able to offer the second line is unethical. So a therapeutic holiday will do the patient, frequently the doc or the nurse, uh, some good. Um, results of this trial do not apply to those who receive pemetrexid or BEV as part of their first-line treatment. In the U.S., the vast majority of patients now are getting either PEM, first-line, or a, a, a bevacizumab combination, either with uh, pemetrexid or paclitaxel. So again, um, the uh, plurality, if not the majority, are doing that. An increasing percentage received PEM as part of their first-line treatment. Neither of these two groups were included in the JMEN trial. PEM maintenance arguably is irrelevant to those two groups, but I think these concerns have at least been partially addressed by the Paramount trial, now the Avapearl trial, although uh, we still lack survival da uh, data for Avapearl uh, for the uh, combination of uh, BEV and PEM in the uh, maintenance setting, whether we look at Avapearl or the landmark analysis of Point Break. So again, um, J-Men looked at a group that did not get PEM or BEV up front. Finally, the 800-pound gorilla, cost. Um, why, is this, why will this approach never occur in the UK? Um, so uh, this is probably old numbers, but uh, at our institution, actually my former institution, $5,400 per uh, cycle for pemetrexid. Median of five cycles, so you do the math, that's 27 grand, and with a median improvement of 5.3 months per patient, I did sort of a back of the envelope, a non-health uh, economist approach, and I got $61,000 per life year gain, which isn't bad. I mean, when you look at dialysis, that's probably $75,000. So it's certainly in the range. However, I was wrong. Uh, this is a publication from Klein et al. and JTO. You can't look at the median, you have to look at the mean. You have patients who are getting not five, but 10, 13, 20, 25 cycles. So when you look at overall cost, the mean is more important than the median. You do that, the numbers double. Now that's still probably in range. There are some interventions out there that are 200, 300, even $400,000 uh, per life year gain. But uh, remember again, this is a, a palliative therapy. And I guess as a society, can we afford to spend this much money and uh, Lilly is sponsoring this symposium, and I do thank them, but remember the CEO of Lilly can change this endpoint with a keystroke on his laptop. Uh, can't change survival, that's fraud. Uh, changing the cost of a drug might be good business sense. Um, point break uh, brings us home further, so uh, as uh, Dr. Sow alluded, uh, this is the landmark analysis from point break, and uh, Frank uh, raised this as well, Frank Dunphy. Uh, these are the folks, uh, who made it to uh, um, uh, the maintenance component of that trial. And if you look here, there's about a, a, a pre-specified uh, uh, PFS analysis uh, uh, 
for the maintenance population. You see about a two-month advantage. And here's the actual survival differences. Again, about two months. Unfortunately, at the time of the presentation, neither a p-value nor a hazard ratio was provided. So we don't know whether this difference is significant. It probably isn't. I suspect if it were, we would have uh, known the p-value. But still, it's tantalizing. And uh, Dr. Sow has taken this to heart. She uses PEMBEV in combination. Um, many of uh, some of my colleagues do as well. Here's the Avapearl data, very similar uh, randomization. This is uh, BEV alone versus PEM and BEV. So the, um, the maintenance uh, components of these two trials are virtually identical. You see a doubling in PFS with a hazard ratio of 0.48. Uh, overall survival has not even been reached in the PEM-BEV combination. So I guess the question I need to ask, and we all need to ask as a group, is it uh, kosher to combine this landmark, uh, landmark analysis from the, these two trials and come up with sort of a mini meta-analysis? And if we do, and we actually see a survival advantage, will cost again rear its ugly head? So uh, six cycles of PEM-BEV were, uh, were given uh, as maintenance and point break versus five of BEV alone. Uh, the difference is here about $38,000. That's a two-month difference, so the cost per life year gained if you multiply six by 38 Somebody can check my math. It's $228,000 per life year gain. Again, I'm not a health economist, but we got to be cognizant of that. So cost is still a fungible endpoint, but God knows in this uh, tight financial times, it's highly relevant. Uh, finally, Saturn. Um, again, this is a little bit washed out, but uh, um, Anne has gone over this. It's a one-to-one -one randomization, relotinib versus placebo. After four cycles of first-line uh, platinum-based treatment, Fewer than half actually went on to the randomization. You see a significant PFS benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.71. Just about every category, gender, ethnic background, histology, including squamous and smoking uh, background, benefited. Uh, the EGFR mutants had a striking benefit. I have never seen a study with a hazard ratio of 0.10. That's probably one of the best uh, ever. Uh, and also quality of life was improved with their lot and the delay in uh, onset of symptoms of uh, pain and uh, uh, need for analgesic use, a trend toward uh, delays in cough, dyspnea, and deterioration. You do see a survival benefit, um, one month difference, but those curves separate out after the median hazard ratio here is 0.81. There's an inherent irony here. The mutation positive group, in fact, did not have a survival benefit despite that striking uh, PFS benefit. And I think that was simply because of small numbers. Uh, it was the uh, wild type group that had the benefit. 21% uh, in the placebo group actually went on to a, a TKI. Uh, here is the grade three uh, toxicity, so one or more 12% versus 1%. But again, if you look at all grades, it's not trivial. Uh, rash and diarrhea are quite common, uh, certainly a lot more common than you'd see in the placebo group. So the criticisms, only 50% of those enrolled actually made it to maintenance randomization, the toxicity of long-term erlotinib is not trivial, and I think it's actually uh, more pronounced than uh, PEM in this setting. PFS improvement, while significant, may be uh, uh, clinically irrelevant. The survival improvement is somewhat underwhelming, but it's still there. And my major criticism, and the same criticism that applies to JMEN, mandatory crossover to a TKI at the time of progression was not featured on this trial. So um, it's a little hard to see, but the, uh, if you look at the uh, subgroup analyses for survival, men, Caucasian, squamous cell current smokers, although there's the hazard ratios in the right direction, the confidence intervals stu still overlap unity, and the, that's a group that doesn't automatically have a benefit. So in conclusion, uh, maintenance treatment in fit motivated patients who are highly symptomatic at the time of initial presentation, I think is quite reasonable, and I do it, and does it. Probably the majority of our colleagues uh, uh, will uh, offer patients this. BEV is part of the 4599 uh, paradigm, but the irony here is it has never been proven versus observation in randomized phase three trials. We simply do not have a trial prospectively validating BEV in that setting. PEM is well tolerated and convenient. We have a PFS and overall survival benefit in both the continuation and switch setting, and it really remains the predominant maintenance drug. The benefits are confined to non-squamous. We have no mature survival data yet for combination PEM and BEV. We certainly have hints that it might be beneficial. 5508 is going to address that question. It's still accruing, uh, only about a third of the way there, but uh, you know, stay tuned. Once it's done, we'll probably have a meta-analysis. And the striking survival advantage that was seen with PEM, and it is striking, it's a five-plus-month advantage, 
would have been far more credible if it had been observed in the context of mandatory crossover. So cost is uh, obviously still a major issue. Uh, what about erlotinib? Again, a modest but statistically significant advantage with respect to both PFS and survival, and I have also used this agent in that setting. Survival benefits are a bit more robust in the phenotypically favored subgroups, so Asians, women, adenocarcinoma, never smokers. Uh, intriguingly and uh, paradoxically, not secure in the mutation positive cohort because those patients are crossing over. The uh, not so striking survival advantage, as we've seen with JMEN, would have been far more credible had there been mandatory crossover. And I credit this study for including quality of life and treatment outcome index. So, again, very reasonable option. I will end here with this uh, reminder that it's uh, cigarettes that get us into trouble. If Ann can join uh, me, and we're going to go back to the uh, question now, hopefully. And then we'll open up the floor for some questions and then go back to the uh, main symposium. So th thank you for your attention.